speaker is a master storyteller. And just like how Jonathan spent his time with me, I've also had the privilege to be invited to have a cup of coffee with our next master storyteller. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together and welcome a global partner of anecdote, Mr. Bharat Aulani, Story Powered Communication. Mr. Bharat, over to you. I've spoken on many a platform, but I've never spoken on a platform where there's no natural break, there's no tea break, and I'm speaking to an audience that has got a full bladder and empty stomach. And the bad news is, lunch is further delayed by 15 minutes. So I do hope that the hotel has got a good buffet and they'll replenish the food very quickly. So help me God, help me people. <laughs> Delay by one more minute. I think it's got a full bladder, just run to the washroom up because that's something that I don't want to hold you from. So in 1995, Harvard Gardner was writing a book on leading minds and was looking at the anatomy of leadership. And what he did was he chose about 11 leaders from different work streams. So there were some from academic, religion, uh, civil rights, and religion. Uh, education, politics, military, and business. And, he's, and he researched them and he found out that these 11 leaders whom he researched, they had a marked behavior on the audience. They could influence their thinking, they could influence their thoughts, their feelings, and their behaviors. And this is what he found out. Sorry, the earlier time. One more, but deleted. Okay, doesn't matter. So that Martin Luther King and the rest. Uh, but these were all leaders of the 20th century. And you know, I spoke about politics and all that, so there's Roosevelt and all of that. Mahatma Gandhi as well. But unfortunately, that's right. Ah, there, there it is. So all these leaders were the leaders of the 20th century. And if you look at today, the communicators of the 21st century are also good storytellers. So, leaders achieve their effectiveness chiefly through the stories they tell. And I'm just sort of re-emphasizing what all the other speakers have said, and that is people do not buy goods and services, they buy relations, stories, and magic. People buy people first. Only then they buy your company, and then they buy your friends. I want you to reflect on this. If you have bought anything recently, was it just because of the price, or was it because of the person who sold it to you? Was it the selling, or that person wanted to make it easy for you to buy from that person? And having spent 25 years in the corporate world, I'm now on my own. My purpose is to help restore humanity to the workplace. I don't have a website. I write once in a while. But my goal is full. So yesterday, I'm supposed to point at you. So yeah, so yesterday I was at Kota Baru and I was invited to speak to the senior civil servants of this country. And we spoke about how do you inject values in your culture. And what I did was, I've never worked in the civil service, but I've always served people in my life. And I shared with them 
the lessons that I've learned in the corporate world. And, and this was all those things I sort of told them. And I, each of this point, I narrated it with a story. Uh, even, I'm sure, you know, all those things that Tantri spoke just now, you'll not remember all the points, but one thing that shines through Tantri's presentation is that his character comes his credentials. I think to many of us, ever since I was a company with a lot of credentials, but today, the character behind the company came through. And I think that's what people will remember. So in a narrative, it's this thing. So one of the things that I told them, of the many stories that I'd like to share with you was a moment in my life when I thought about purpose. And that came very late uh, when I was about 40 plus. And I was on a leadership journey, on a journey to greatness. And Unilever, my employer, sent me to Dharamshala, where the Tibetans live in exile. And the Dalai Lama also commands moral authority and he lives there. And my brief was very clear. What can we learn from them that we could apply to the business? And on that journey, one morning I was walking on the road and I met two boys. One was 14 and the other one was 12. And the elder one was Dorji. And he had the eyes, like what Tantri mentioned, you know, very bright eyes. And you just wanted the eyes was sort of speaking to you. And his lips were frostbitten, nose was a bit frostbitten as well. So what had happened was, his parents had sent him all the way from Lhasa, Tibet, with some relatives to go and serve the Dalai Lama. That means the Dalai Lama will look after his education, will help him grow, and when he grows up, he'll actually serve the community. And that's what people do when they are many children. So I met this boy and I asked him, I think now that you have come to India from Tibet, where would you like to study? And he said, wherever his holiness sends me. The second question was a typical Indian question. And I asked him, would you like to become a doctor or an engineer? <laughs> but his answer surprised me. Dorje said, I want to become a teacher. A 14-year-old boy wanted to become a teacher. And I asked him, why a teacher? And you know what he said? In back home, my parents my relatives get cheated because they don't know how to count. So I want to grow up, become a math teacher, and I teach my people to count better. A 14-year-old boy had his purpose very clear. And if someone were to ask me at that time what my purpose was, it was to polish the right shoes so that I could grow well in the corporate career. And that's when I first started thinking of purpose. So when I finished my session, the organizer of the conference came to me and said, Sir, would you join us in Philippines next month because we like you to guide us. It was my story that got my next assignment. And some of you know that in December, I actually went to Sadora uh, to run a workshop. And the person who invited me, he said, Bharat, you don't need a proposal. Are you available on that day? Because she had heard about my purpose journey. So I just want to emphasize that people buy relationships. People want to do business with people they like. Of course, you need your content, you need your authenticity, all that is there. But you know, there are times when everything is fine, but you are just not comfortable. Has that happened before? So I've done this session many a time, but I want to make it easy for you to tell a story. Because Telling a story is like a treadmill, you know, you can have a treadmill at home, but if you never get on a treadmill, you will never become a better, better storyteller. And there are many of us in this room, you have probably heard me speak, and you may be wondering what am I going to learn from him today. So I am going to encourage you to sort of reflect a bit, and I'd like you to sort of think of a moment in your professional life when your work impacted a person or a participant in a positive way. Because I believe it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. So if you can impact one or two lives, I think it's mission accomplished. So would you like to just reflect on it? You know, all of us are professional speakers. 
Uh, our voice is our power, and some are aspiring professional speakers. And my challenge to you is this. Is there someone in the room who is not comfortable speaking on stage? Or someone who says that I don't have a story to tell? And I have to encourage that person to take the courage to come here and tell that story. And I'll make it very easy for you to make it a better story than I. I think that's a better way to learn. So can I have a volunteer? Can I have a volunteer? You raise your hand if there's a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer? Please raise your hand. Ah, I got Elena. Elena, can you give her a round of applause? Elena has flown all the way from Kuching. So my question to Elena is very simple. Has, work, has her work impacted somebody in a positive way? And she's going to talk about it. And I hope I get an opportunity to coach her. Or you know, she may not need me to say anything. So thank you, Elena, and we'll get you a mic. Uh, can I have a mic for Elena? Yeah, you also can just stand here. Can we have a mic for Elena? So Elena, uh, you are from Kuching. Where did you fly down? Where did you fly? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. Was it a good flight? One of the best flights. One of the best flights? Yeah. Why? Because there's a slight turbulence, actually. <clears throat> there's a slight turbulence where it gives me the thrill of having that turbulence. <laughs> oh, nice. Roller coaster. Oh, I love roller coasters. Wow, and and Anna gives for... you that you don't need to go to Florida. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm looking forward to roller coasters. So, uh, Elena, would you like to share a moment in your working life okay. where you felt that someday it will impact uh, positively from your work? Okay. Uh, right then. Most probably, okay, I won't be talking about in my working life, perhaps I'll be talking about my daily life, where I travel a lot. Travel a lot as in within the Malaysia itself. And I didn't actually realize that my story can actually impact other people. It's just that I like to travel a lot as in um, uh, on a plane and walking around and doing my things. Uh, like I still, even despite losing my sight, I still enjoy outdoors activities. Like I still go to kayak across the island. I do hiking, uh, hiking as well, and I still uh, go swimming as well. And for me, whatever I did was considered like how you do in your daily life, cooking. And when I travel, and my assistant asks me, "What do I do? Where do I go?" and said, "Oh, I'm just going here for." holiday with a friend, cycling, this and that, and I cook, and I do this and that. Oh, okay, why don't you share your story? And I said, why would I want to share my story? Because by listening to my story, it actually helps the people. They makes them realize that with their sight, they see their problems, you know, very difficult. Instead, as for me, me without sight. I'm still doing do the things that I do and I just keep on go on and do it. And say so you should share your story because what you do will inspire other people. Because they feel like when they face the problem, they feel it's a big deal. But when they see you, it feels them feel like oh, come on, I'm with my sight and I'm feeling my problem is okay. so I'm gonna stop you here. Of course. <laughs> so can I have the permission to help you? Okay. Alright, I'm just going to ask you a few questions okay. and then you answer them. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Alright. So, when was the last time you shared a bit about yourself to someone? Uh, I mean, even yesterday I shared it in a plane. Okay. Uh, yesterday on a plane? On a plane. And what, what time was it? What time so, was what time were you flying in? From uh, in the morning. In the morning? Yeah. And whom did you share that with? 
person next to me because she thought I was not well uh, as somebody was assisting me to the plane. Alright, so it was a lady? Or? It was a lady. Alright, so yesterday morning when you were flying in from Kuala was it immediately when the flight took off or after a while when you started speaking to her? Uh, it was immediately actually. Okay, so as soon as the flight took off, this lady next to you, you started speaking. Right. Do you remember her name? Yes, Alison. You spoke to Alison? Yes. Okay, and what did you tell Alison? Uh, no, she first she asked me what that. What did Alison ask you? Uh, are you not feeling well yeah. because I saw somebody is assisting you? Okay. And then what did you say? Uh, um, I said that I'm sorry, I'm a visually impaired person, so okay. somebody is assisting me. Yeah. Did you say anything else to her after that? No, and she keep on continually asking me, why do I travel? What do I do? Yeah. Oh, very good. And did you, how did you answer that? Did you share one moment with her? Why you travel? Or yeah, you I, I said, um, uh, Can you just share one moment? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was saying that I'm attending the speakers convention. Yes. Yeah. And what else? And how do I get to where, let's say, for example, from a plane, how do people assisting me? And how do I get from one place to another place? Good. And did you tell her how are you feeling uh, coming for this conference? Or what were you feeling at that time when you were coming for this conference? Uh, this I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't is actually... This is the first time you are attending this conference? Yeah, this is my first time attending the conference. And how were you feeling uh, at that time? Did you have that roller coaster feeling? No, I'm excited actually, looking forward to it. Looking forward to meet to all of the people. And, and why did you want to attend this conference? There's a lot of effort to come all the way from Puchin. But, but why did you come here? Because I want to gain knowledge and learn from all of you. Fantastic. So, can I sort of help her tell a story? Alright. So, a lot of people, Elena, you've given me the permission, huh? so yes. I'm going to be yes. straightforward. Yes. With you. yes. So, a lot of people are actually talking and, when, and they think they're telling a story. So, if you are telling a story, it must have a few elements that helps you visualize and helps you feel. So even though you, you are visually impaired, but yeah. the other person should be able to see yes. what you are saying. Mm -hmm. So one, first thing is, there are certain elements that a story must have. Number one is there must be a time marker or a place marker. So I took off from Kuching yesterday morning. It was a morning flight and there was a lady sitting next to me. Uh, that will come later. So, but there's a time marker and a place marker. Time was yesterday morning, taking off from Kuching. Which airline was it? Sorry? Which, which airline was it? Oh, Air Asia. It was Air Asia. So, suddenly the credibility goes up. Because every time you tell a story, you're also fighting for credibility. Because story, people will think you're making up. So, when you put these details, it makes you more credible. Okay? And then I, I've traveled many a times, but this flight was special because we are flying into Kuala Lumpur to attend the MAPS conference. And you are attending the MAPS conference because knowledge never stops. So she's come here to, net, to meet all of us, but at the same time to gain. So there's a sequence of events. So when she's speaking, now you know that it's a travel, there's a different kind of a travel. It's not a travel for kayaking or hiking, but it's a travel to seek knowledge. So there's a sequence of events, right? The third is there must be a character in your story and there must be a conversation. So the character in her story is Alison who was sitting next to her and Alison was a bit worried about her and she said, are you all right? Because I see somebody helping you. And then he said, no, I'm all right. The only thing I'm usually in bed. And that's the element of surprise. The, because if I'm listening to you, tell me something that I've not heard before. And that person, Elisa, thought that she had, she was not well, but then she said, look, I'm actually all right, but I'm visually impaired, so I'm a bit nervous. So the story has a time marker, a place marker, a sequence of events, characters, something unexpected. Now all that is fine, that qualifies it to be a story. So now you can start seeing and you can start feeling. But in a business environment or in a conference where all of you are paid to come and listen. Why the hell am I listening to your story? What's the point you are trying to make? 
and I am attempting to guess the point you are trying to make. And the point you are trying to make is life is limitless. Being visually impaired does not stop me from gaining knowledge and from traveling. Was that the point you are trying to make? That's right. Give her a round of applause. This can be done in about 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You don't need that long a time. So, always when you are sharing, share an experience, share one moment, because that's what you will remember. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. And we'll work on this for the next two days, and we'll make this a 30 second thing. Thank, thank you so much, and thank you, Kiran. Thank you. Thank you. So, a story must have a time marker and a place marker, sequence of events, and here you need to be careful. Don't tell everything you know. Only tell what your audience should know. So that's why I like John what he said, you stuck only to four points. I'm sure you had 50 other points to make, but you made a choice of grit. And I think the four points are easy to remember, not 50. Alright, so very, very important is something called the curse of knowledge. All of us have gone through life and unfortunately we got too much knowledge and that sometimes becomes a curse. Always have characters in a business context. You are fighting for credibility because you are saying, because story sometimes has a negative kind of a, uh, connotation. If you say, look, I'm going to tell you a story, somebody say, are you making up? Like in Bahasa, they say, Apo Charita Gitu, what story are you making up? So when you have this, uh, details, then your credibility goes up and also only mention one or two characters. And here are characters there is, and I'm sure there are so many other people on the flight, but she only chose. And something that's unexpected. See, if I'm listening to you, tell me something that I have to remember. Now, all that is fine, but you know where most of us make a mistake is, what's the business point we are trying to make? What is the point you are trying to make? So every time you speak, Always remember what the point you are trying to make and then you craft your story. Are we good? Yes. Alright, so stories are facts, wrapped in context, delivered with emotion. Because we are all drowning in data, we are drowning in information, but we are struggling to make sense out of it. So stories sort of help you to put things in context and help you deliver with emotion. So I'm going to do a small exercise with you and this is a very short video, it's about uh, 60, uh, it's about 70 seconds and it's from a series called Mad Men where there are all these advertising people and this gentleman here is trying to sell an idea for Hershey chocolate. You know Hershey, right? Yeah. And he's trying to sell them an idea for the next eclat, for the next advertising and in his speech, Mirja, there is some one moment where he's actually telling a story. And I want you to spot where is the story in this video and to re-emphasize the point which Lindsay also made, at what point is he selling the relationship? Or at what point is he sharing a relationship? Are you game for that? Yeah. Alright, so all you need to do is at what point in the video is Don telling the story and what happens? Can we play the video? Every agency you're going to meet with feels qualified to advertise a Hershey bar because the product itself is one of the most successful billboards of all time. And its relationship with America is so overwhelmingly positive that everyone in this room has their own story to tell. It could be rations and heat and battle in the movie theater on the first day, but most of them are from childhood. Mine was my father taking me to the drugstore after I moved along and telling me I could have anything I wanted, anything at all, and there was a lot, but I picked a Hershey bar. The wrapper looked like what was inside, and as I ripped it open, my father tousled my hair, and forever his love and the chocolate were tied together. That's the story we're going to tell. Hershey's is the currency of affection. It's the childhood symbol 
of love. Well, we'll be a lucky little boy. <laughs> Our company excels in television, and we'll tell you exactly when and where to tell those stories. Sweet tales of childhood. I suppose we So, with a time by the idea of how many can you remember? I have a TV station. Tell me when is your advertising going to be ready? We'll buy the spot for you. Did you get that? They immediately accepted it. When will it be ready? Now, my question to you is what point was the story? Can we? Can we do that? Yeah, uh, was there a story in the pitch? Yeah, when? Yeah, but when did, at what point did it start? Do you remember? When I went to the school. Yeah, but yeah, continue just that. Yeah, just that. Uh, when he was a child. Yeah, that's when the relationship started. That's a time mark and a place mark. When I was a child, my father took me to a drugstore. Well spotted. Give him a, give him a clap. And I hope so. That's what you did. So every time you speak, you have a choice in how you want to communicate. One is you make a lot of assertions, you make a lot of statements. Or, alternately, you could make a statement and then take people to moments where people can start visualizing it, when people can start feeling it. So I'm going to help deconstruct this short uh, video that I just showed you from a point of learning from this. So he started by making a statement and his statement was, every company feels that they are qualified to make an advertisement for Hershey. That was a broad statement, correct? And then he made some broad events. It could be rations, it could be a first day, it could be childhood. So these are very broad statements, correct? And then he started telling a story. And mine was, when I went to my father, he took me to a drugstore, and he says, you can choose anything you like. And I chose, and I chose the Hershey bar and my father tussled my head. Got that? And then he goes to a statement, and he says, that's the, currency, that's the currency of affection, it's a symbol of love. And that's the point he was trying to make. So if you look at the basic storytelling pattern, you always start with a statement, and John, you started like, I'm gonna talk about my roller coaster experience. And then you ended with that. So always start with a relevant statement, and then you tell your story, and then again you make the point. The feeling the first time, and the feeling after having done it changed. So in similar thing, Don started with a relevant statement, and then he told the story, and then he made a point. And how do you want, and what's the business point that we are trying to make out of it? And the business point was, that's the story we are going to tell Harshil, the childhood symbol of love. Lindsay, story is set. And the whole thing took about little more than 70 seconds, but it was the 25 second story that made all the difference. So I'm going to, I got about four more minutes, so I'm just going to leave some tips for you. It's all about delivery. How are you going to deliver a story? So number one is, you must put the context right. And it must be relevant to the audience. And when you are on stage, people want to know a bit about your vulnerability, about your imperfect start, because that's what the audience is interested in. Because the success is all in the social media. But there's also a lot of pain behind the success. And it's very important that you use an intimacy skill. Because in a one-to-one -one conversation, you can probably be a bit more intimate. But on a public forum, you need to be a bit comfortable. How much you want to share? So when I speak to students, I talk about how I was taught stealing when I was in school. And what I learned from that lesson in stealing. But if you're in a public forum, then you talk something that you're comfortable. So you decide. But if you come on the stage, you've got to reveal 
a bit about who you are because every story you tell shows something about who you are. You know, when you are on the platform, probably time is on your side. But if you are on a business meeting, time is not on your side. So you need to probably do it in about 30 seconds or 60 seconds. So if you are, a story should never, never, never be more than three minutes. And it can also be six words. You know, the longest, the shortest story in the world was told by Ernest Hemingway in six words. And I think the six words were, if I remember correctly, I have written it here. Anybody remembers the Ernest Hemingway's shorter story? For sale. Six, six words. For sale, baby shoes, never want. There is a shorter story ever in six words. Now, if you are telling a strategy story, you are telling a story about things that are going to impact the vision, mission. You can probably take five or six minutes. But normally your story should be anything between 90 to 180 seconds. And when you are on stage, it's not about performance. It's about the delivery. It's not about impressing people. It's about speaking to express and not to impress. And one of my favorite is Simon Sinek. You know, you come to, I know I've attended many a conference, and some people really back up. Uh, I mean, they wear the finest stuff to be on the stage. And then when you tell people what do you remember, people will always remember Simon Sinek. And if you see Simon on the stage, you connect with him. He's just like us. He's just like Vince's father. He's one of us. He does not sort of dress up. He's very natural, very comfortable. But he speaks from his heart. So always remember, it's all about effectiveness. And it's not about the impressions you make. And this is a very important tip, which is stories in business are invisible. So as much as possible, don't try to say that I'm going to tell you a story. Because the minute I'm going to tell you a story, people become judgmental. Because story as you know it in our childhood, is about making up stories. It's about imagining stories. And the better stories you told, the better marks your teacher gave you. But at work, it does not work that way. Because we, we got stakeholders to manage. Uh, we got mission to deliver. We got CSR, we got to make money so that we can give back more. So, tell a story without using the S word. So, say, and how do you do it? You transition it into a story and slip a story into a conversation. So, it could be, you know, back in 2012, a, a researcher named Gardner did a study of research and he told that the most uh, uh, influential speakers tell better stories. Then we tell the story about the Gardner research. Well, it took that. I remember when I was a child, uh, when I was studying in school, I was caught stealing, and my teacher told me that when somebody steals your stuff, you got no right to steal somebody else's stuff. Two rights, two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, oh, I saw a good example of this yesterday. You know, when I was traveling, uh, uh, Edison spoke to me, and then he told the story. I've seen similar things, but I also the opposite happens. So that's another way. So when I'm speaking to the civil servants, uh, I also noticed that there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of similarities because both are serving people. The business is serving people. The civil servants are also serving people. The only common thing is the civil servants should help business become more successful and make it easy for business people to do more business so that they can pay more taxes. And that will help the civil servants to serve better. Then you tell the story of one incident, which actually happened yesterday because the lady said she actually worked to provide housing to people who didn't have houses. And she told about one incident that it was an allocation of 10,000 ringgit from the government, but it changed the family's life forever. So that was a very powerful story. And a lot of civil servants actually told the stories. And the only request they made was keep us away from the politicians. And here's an example that really illustrates the point. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your lunch.